Hey guys, so I'm here on my kind of sailor wall, if you want to call it that, with my decor here and my history bounding outfit because today we are going to be doing a book review of Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe, I believe, is a piece of classic literature. It's not to the same status that Little Women or Pride and Prejudice would be, but it is a well-known piece of classic literature. Now, it's actually, I think, I could be wrong, but it might be the first piece of classic literature that I have read. I know I am very much behind. I'm hoping to read Pride and Prejudice and some of those soon. It was a very interesting book in that it surprised me in a lot of ways. So first things first, I actually did not read the real Robinson Crusoe first thinking that the story might have subject matter in it that I would not want to read, but still liking the idea of a castaway story, I made the mistake of reading a kid's adaptation of the story first. And long story short, it was horrible. I thought I did not like Robinson Crusoe because the kid's book, first of all, <laughs> left out some content that the original had, partly to make it, you know, not quite as the end of Robinson Crusoe is a little bit violent in places, but, um, not just for that, but for the sake of they took out all the references to God, which actually I'm going to explain to you in a minute that there's actually some pretty good stuff in here as far as, you know, about God's providence and stuff. And so it was all about fate, and then the way it was written, it made you really bummed at the end of the story because since they took God out of it, it was like, what was the purpose to all of that? And obviously he can't be reunited with his parents because his parents, you know, he's been gone for so long, they're no longer alive. And it was like, gee, that was a horrible story. Maybe I won't actually read it. But then, through a uh, homeschool friend, I actually found out that the real Robinson Crusoe, Robinson Crusoe was not that way at all, and I was like, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll give it a try. I um, have generally, obviously, steered clear of sailor stories because they usually have things in them that I don't want to read about. But, given that the person who recommended it to me was younger, and I just thought I'd give it a try. And honestly, I was quite surprised and pretty pleased with what I found. So, first off, I thought I would give you a quick introduction to Daniel Defoe, who is the author of Robinson Crusoe. I actually really liked this version. It's just from the library, and I really need to get it back to the library. It actually, in the front, includes a chronology of the author's life, so you could kind of get an idea of when he lived. So, he lived during the Glorious uh, Revolution, Queen Anne's reign, and George I's reign. He was born sometime around 1660 and died in 1731. In contrast, Robinson Crusoe, according to the story, was born in 1632, so it's interesting to think about that Daniel Defoe was basically writing a story about a man who was probably from the previous generation, his father's generation, or maybe his grandfather's generation. So, to start off, an overview of the book plot. Now, this is gonna be tricky. This is a long, long book, and it actually took me months to get through because it really drags in some places. And for me, one of the hard parts, you know, I mean, it wasn't super hard, but there's no chapter markings in it. Um, you know, this is an older, obviously this was published, I want to say, uh, 17, I think, I think I saw it was 1719? Yeah, April 1719 was when this was first published. So it's obviously in an older writing style, and uh, there's no chapters. I assume that was just a part of literature from the period. It was a pretty good read. It just was long and a little bit difficult to swallow in times because of the writing style. It starts off with Robinson Crusoe as a young man, and he longs for adventure. He wants to get out on the sea. He has a thirst for the sea, like every sailor does or should or does in literature or whatever. And Obviously, his parents aren't so on board with that. In fact, his father counsels him that, you know, if he is dissatisfied with his life, he's from a middle-class family, that honestly he could live a very prosperous life. His father counsels him that it's probably not a good idea and that he'll probably deal with some misfortunes because sailors obviously sailing at this time especially, you know, this was still somewhat the earlier days of cross Atlantic travel, so his father counsels him that he's probably not gonna live a very good life and probably going to have a lot of unfortunate experiences if he goes off and becomes a sailor. 
because that's a lot of times what happened to sailors. And of course, that's exactly what happens. Robinson Crusoe, first of all, has to get his sea legs. He has to spend some time on some ships and like, you know, has to figure out how to be a sailor. But to be a sailor, he actually has to run away from his parents. And he has lots of thoughts of turning back, especially whenever he's really sick on the ships and thinks about turning back. And ultimately, he continues to be a sailor despite the fact that it's probably continuing to be a bad idea and he should just go home and live the life that his father recommended he live because he would be a lot more content and the better for it. So as he's going throughout his adventures, he gets captured, or the ship he's on gets captured by pirates and he lives for a while as a servant of, I think it's the pirate captain or something like that. Eventually he escapes and ends up becoming a crew member on another ship with, I believe that by this time it's the one with the Portuguese captain who's very kind to him and, you know, rescued him from, you know, as, as he was escaping, he picked basically picked Robinson Crusoe up in a little boat he was in and, you know, allowed him to become part of the ship. They're, they're friends, basically, for the rest of the book. And I think at some point, I can't remember if he goes back to England and then goes to Brazil, but at some point he goes to Brazil and starts a plantation and it becomes prosperous. But, of course, that's not enough. He's got to get back out there on the ocean. So he embarks on another journey. Uh, might be a couple journeys. It's hard to keep track, especially because it took me so long to read it that it's impossible for me to remember the exact order and timing of everything. But he goes on another journey, which of course is the most famous one, the one that you're waiting the entire book to get to, and it's the one where his ship crashes on an island after a horrible storm. He is the only survivor, and he's in quite a pitiful state for some period of time. The bulk of the story, the, the main, a lot of the middle of the story takes place on the island and it's about how he survives and kind of his miserable state as he calls it for a while and then there's like his journal basically that he keeps and it, it can be, it, it kind of goes from like exciting and interesting to like really boring and it kind of goes back and forth as far as what's actually interesting especially because like in the process of showing you his journal he basically like repeats himself with a bunch of information, but oh well. He spends a lot of time on the island. He is down in the dump sometimes. This is just this miserable state. He's the only one. And then there are other, I think there's another ship that crashes on the island he gets more supplies from. You know, he has different pet animals and stuff like that. But eventually, uh, after quite some time of him being on the island, I don't remember exactly how it happens, but he is starts thinking about God. I think it's some kind of a, a pivotal something happens. It's, it's such a huge book that it's really hard to know, like, where everything was. Do, 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 she. Okay, that I was right. That's what I thought. Basically, an earthquake strikes, and Robinson Crusoe is inside his tent in his cave at the time, and he's so terrified that I think he thinks that, like, he's gonna die, and it, it just, like, freezes him for a while because it was so terrifying. It, it kind of briefly side mentions all this while I had no not the serious religious thought and then he's dejected and it's raining and it kind of doesn't say anything else but then there's something about the ship. I thought I was close, sorry. Okay, and he gets really, really sick. Okay, he gets really, really sick. It's, it's called egg. A-G-U-E. It's like fever and, and chills, and um, I think according to the notes in the back that he probably had some sort of mal malaria. Yeah, yeah, he's been praying to God because he's so sick and he doesn't have anyone to help him because he's all alone and he has a dream. Now, obviously, you know, he's someone that doesn't know God, so his dream is not the most accurate thing, but he has a dream that God is going to punish him because he has not repented, even, I guess, maybe because of all all the, the time God has given him, I don't know. Which, obviously, you know, it's kind of this idea in this dream of God, of like, you know, kind of this big, giant, angry, you know, seeing all these things have not brought thee to repentance, now thou shalt die, kind of a thing, which, obviously, you know, he doesn't know God, so... But, that does inspire him to think about God more. And it makes him think about how during 
all this time, he hasn't hardly had a single thought of God, and he hasn't been a fear of God. This is either a fear of God in danger, or of thankfulness to God in his deliverance. And he thinks about all the things he's come through, and how he didn't pay any attention to what God was doing, even whenever the most, you know, when he was picked up by the Portuguese captain, and that was the best thing that could have happened, and was truly a deliverance, and how he didn't even thank God about it. And he didn't thank God for being rescued on this island, even though all of his fellow mates drowned. He wasn't thankful to God for that. Now it says his conscience that has slept so long was beginning to awake. He's considering his life, what has happened, and realizing in how many places God's providence has brought him through. He's starting to recover, and he opens up a Bible. He just opens the book up, and the first words that he he kind of lands on is the verse called on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver and thou shalt glorify me which according to the notes he's misquoting slightly the authorized version of Psalm 50 15 and call upon me in the day of trouble I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me so he that's that verse comes up again later in the book he's, he's continuing to think and to dwell upon the, the scriptures about how God has delivered him and he starts to read the Bible and he asks Jesus to give him repentance. I mean, this is like, I, you've seen how many pages I'm turning here. There's a lot of bulk to this book, and there's a lot of just describing him going around his life, so getting to the point is a little bit hard here. Basically, he gives his life to God, and he starts to pray, and you know, he worships God, he reads his Bible, and he, he enters in what at least seems to be in the book, you know, Obviously, it's a little bit more ritualistic because that was the way of the times, but he really does, it seems like he does have a relationship with Jesus. At least, you know, it would appear that way. There's no way to know for sure. He goes about his life for some time and continues with all of his, you know, survival methods and tries making pots and tr goes on different adventures with his little boat, which, you know, he grows to regret. But then we come to the last third or so of book and this is where he sees footprint and one thing that I find interesting about Robinson Crusoe is his thought process about you know God and spiritual things like that and how he comes to different conclusions I take notice of because obviously they're different but in some ways it's a lot more mature of an approach than even a lot of modern Christian fiction <laughs> which honestly like I was reading the book and I was like gee whiz I mean there's some stuff in here, I mean, there's a level to a certain degree of theology in here that a lot of modern Christian fiction doesn't have in it. And there were things that I disagreed with, and I'll get to those in a minute. But basically, he sees a footprint, a big footprint that's not like his footprint. And his first thought is that it's the devil or something. But then, he starts to think about how that's not biblical, that's not realistic. And it says all this seemed inconsistent with the thing itself and with as and with all the notions we usually entertain of the subtlety to the, the to the devil so basically he's saying it was just a silly thing and you know like most times we just jump to conclusions about you know something being evil or something he concludes that it must be that there are some people that come onto the island now one thing that i don't care for is that even though he talks about, you know, his friend that comes later that's one of the native people as, you know, very beautiful, handsome, and, and he kind of praises the person not just in appearance but also in, in their, their the kindness and things like that, but he does reference them as savages, which obviously was a cultural thing of the time. I, I personally don't refer to any group of people as savages, even if they are barbaric, which these people are, because I believe that all people are people, and, you know, to call them savages is discriminating against them and, and making them sound like they're less. Um, and they are barbaric in this story, but, you know, I don't care for that. But I do appreciate that despite that cultural implication, Robinson Crusoe does try, it does see them as, you know, uh, beautiful and in many ways. Now, the last third of the book wasn't my favorite because it, it does get a little bit more violent. Throughout the beginning of the book, it was more... Uh, it, it just showed a little bit less of the actual action, even with the pirate ship. There wasn't really any... Uh, obviously, I don't think there's any language in the book, um, even though he's a sailor, because he's looking back on his life and kind of just giving you the general gist of what happened, and so he doesn't really get into a lot of detail and violence. But basically, once you get into the last third of the book, he has these encounters with these cannibals, which obviously is kind of a disgusting thing in and of itself. It doesn't, like, show them 
eating people or something, but it kind of shows there's a couple of scenes where it's like the place where they normally go in the aftermath of that, which was a little bit, I mean, it wasn't like super graphic, but it was a little bit gross and just kind of like, gee whiz, which I don't know how much this book was based in accuracy. I suppose it is possible, but I also don't know if it was just something the author created for the sake of the story. I don't know, I haven't researched that, but basically he gets so mad about this barbaric practice of cannibalism that he starts to entertain ideas of just like killing all of them, but as he thinks about them and he's like, well, it's God's job to deal with this, not me. I think there might have even been something along the lines of if I just kill them, how am I better than they are? Now, don't get me wrong, he's still very upset about what's happening, but he kind of reins it in and, and the, you know, decides I think this is for God to take care of. Now, what is interesting is that later in the story, in order to rescue one of the fellow native people that's been captured by the other native people, as he rescues him, I think he actually, like, shoots a couple of the other people. So after he gets he, Friday is what he calls his his companion the the native guy that he rescued and all, again you know he kind of tends to think of him as his companion that will go with him and maybe even be his servant or I don't know if he calls him a slave but there's still kind of some of those cultural ideas of the native people being less even though Robinson Crusoe does think very fondly of Friday you know talks about how he's you know beautiful of appearance that's not really how we would describe a man today but you know and very capable and things like that and Robinson Crusoe actually shares his faith with Friday I don't know if Friday ever comes to know Jesus truly or not but Robinson Crusoe does share Jesus with him and obviously there is some mention of what Friday's you know native people their religion something about that but there's this European ship that's been taken over by some mutinies that ends up on the island ends up kind of coming to the island because the people who mutinied and took over the ship are such bad sailors uh, that they don't really know where they're going and honestly we're probably not going to survive out here but basically long story short Robinson Crusoe gets the ship back in the possession of the captain oh. Basically, the captain gives the possession of the ship to Robinson Crusoe, and this was the part of the story where I was really just trying to get the story done, even though it kind of was actually pretty interesting. But one place that the book differs, the, the kid's book differs greatly from Robinson Crusoe, is the last third of the book, in that there's no violence, and it leaves out a lot of the stuff. In fact, it entirely leaves out his adventures when he goes back to Europe. But basically, there's some violence as Robinson Crusoe gets, you know, the ship back to the captain, and... Obviously, I know that for a lot of people, that's okay, that, and you know, that's, that's just a part of literature, and that was just a part of life, and that's just a part of, you know, getting your shit back to the captain, which I get that, but for me, I was just a little bit disappointed because, like, Robinson Crusoe had been, like, so, he just seemed more like a peaceful person, and for me, you know, I personally wouldn't shoot somebody. I know that's definitely a personal thing and that not everyone will agree with me on that so please don't blow a head gasket if you don't agree with me on that but I guess for just for me it seemed almost like a change since he had decided that you know it was God's job to deal with the native cannibals and he wasn't gonna do that that then later he's like you know shooting them to save this one person which I mean save one person is a good thing but you know in the kids book it didn't have all that <laughs> which I understand is realistic but just for me I was like I really wish that it didn't have to have that in it but um, they they get the ship back and I think they go back to Europe I think he actually meets the old Portuguese captain again I'm not completely sure yeah he gets back to Europe learns of how his plantation has fared and in closing of the story you know he's he decides he's gonna go back to Brazil which probably isn't a good idea but I think he ends up getting back there okay and you know there's adventures of him just getting to the different ports in Europe you know there's wolves and things like that <laughs> he gives you a very quick rundown I mean it even in one like long paragraph tells you that he got married and had kids and then his wife died so then I think it's even like his kids grow up or something like that all in like the last little bit of the story and then you know it ends with he might perhaps give a further account hereafter now actually i think that there are two sequels to robinson crusoe i don't know if i will read them or not because reading the first book took so long but it's kind of an interesting thought now i'm going to give you an overview of what i thought of the book as far as the theology i kind of already did that and kind of did that with the violence but so basically the theology for the most part you know it obviously 
was a little different than mine and I disagree in some places but as with anything you take it with a grain of salt in the end it wasn't a point made of you know a matter of conscience in protecting the other people and stuff with the shooting of guns and getting the captain his thing back but basically like you know I appreciated his thought process uh, obviously he was still a fairly new Christian so he wasn't bringing it back to scripture quite as much as I would but he was kind of reining things in and considering things in light of you know truth and also I really appreciated how he chose to be grateful in fact there's a quote I really like that's something along the lines of all of our discontentments whatever they may be seem to spring from a want of thankfulness for what we have and I really appreciated that idea that was communicated through the book of we should be always grateful because there are always going to be good things that we can be grateful for that God has given us the writing style was it was just different okay I mean let's face it this was published in 1719 and for the record I actually read a Plymouth Plantation and they're both like they're, they're hard to read like because it's really long sentences you could have an entire paragraph that is one sentence full of commas and colons and just the punctuation style is even different there aren't quotation marks it's it's like the use of italics or something and it changes which part of the quotation is italicized and whether the quotation you know the scripture like I said you know is italicized and so it was kind of confusing on that sense but then again it is a piece of older literature so that's to be expected would I read it again maybe I took so long to get through this book and honestly I actually really loved the book except for that last third where it does get a little bit violent and I just didn't care for that as much honestly if you could just like read the book without the last third and just like know he gets back to England that would almost be better it didn't ruin the book but for me, it was just kind of a, a bummer at the end. When you get to the end and it's kind of more violent after it's been so peaceful and calm. Maybe I would if I wanted to because it still was mostly clean. Would I recommend it to someone else? Maybe if I knew that they were mature and, you know, that they weren't... I mean, it was clean, but there was some violence at the end and obviously the parts with cannibals are a little like, whoa. But if I knew the person was going to take it with a grain of salt, maybe it was okay i really enjoyed especially kind of the first two thirds but the last third kind of let it down for me because you know i just didn't really want it to end with all that violence although it was cool because like you know he actually ends up starting a colony on the island and fun fact obviously this is not a true story despite the fact that for whatever reason daniel defoe writes the intro like this is actually a factual account there is actually a Robinson Crusoe Island. It's off the coast of South America. I can't remember on which side, but yeah, there is a Robinson Crusoe Island, which is pretty funny. Overall, I enjoyed reading it, and I certainly don't have any regrets about reading it, but I would be careful about recommending it to someone else simply because it was a little bit inconsistent. And, you know, there was some violence toward the last third of the book. And, you know, it, it's just hard for me to know, like, you know, when I recommend a book, how mature the reader is going to be. I hope you enjoyed my insights on Robinson Crusoe and the, my attempt to just put the story in a nutshell. Again, not a horrible book, not my favorite book. If you have read Robinson Crusoe, I would love to know your take on it. Thanks for watching this video and stick around because I like to do videos on writing tips, writing advice, and vlogs. Yeah, so stick around and thanks for watching. Adios mis amigas y Dios te bendiga. Bye bye. Hi mom.